Today's class, we are privileged to have in our midst Madam Joyce Chumesi Edu as our guest lecturer for the class. Um, if I want to read her biography or her profile, we will not end today. Um, but by way of uh, a quick introduction, she did attend the University of Ghana, just like most of the guest lecturers who have been coming. Um, she did her bachelor's University of Ghana first class, and I'm hoping that all of you get first class one day. Already some of you have given up on, <laughs> on first class. <laughs> it's just too early in the day to give up. Um, beyond the University of Ghana, our guest lecturer also attended the University of Leicester, where she had a postgraduate uh, diploma, employee relations. She also attended the Webster University, a Master of Arts, uh, International Relations and Affairs. And she's been working for the past 21 years uh, at GCB Bank. I'm sure way before most of you were born. <laughs> Currently, she's manager, human relations, um, employee relations and welfare at GCB Bank Ghana Limited or GCB Bank PLC. So without wasting much time, let's put our hands together and welcome our guest speaker for today. Good morning, class. It's actually exciting to be here. I'm looking at your faces and I'm telling myself, once upon a time, I was like this. And so it means that there's hope for the future. Oh, yeah, there is. Okay. One thing I would want you, before I even start the class, one thing I would want is that we pay attention. A lot of times when you have lectures, is on the hardcore subject. You hardly have lectures on the soft core parts. But that's also very important because to make you a holistic person, you need both the hard core and the soft core. For today, we are going to do grooming. And I must confess that I don't see you students as very well groomed. I'm sorry. This is not to slight you, but hi, Kelvin. <laughs> That's my nephew. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, coming into, coming into the wider world, it's so easy to see your world as within the four walls of a city. And you have a small school, so you feel protected. You feel, you feel like, oh, it's nothing. My hostel is just here. It's just like a hundred steps and I'm in the lecture room. So um, when I wake up, I just put on anything and I come for lectures. It shouldn't be so. There are people who work from home and from their bedroom to their study is their office and they need to be well groomed for the job. So the fact that your hostel is just here and you are coming for lectures. You shouldn't be in flip-flops. I see a lot of you in slippers. You shouldn't be accepted. When you are coming for lectures, you should be in sandals at least. Yeah. You see, because university is a serious training ground. From university, you are going into the world. In secondary school, because you have university to still adjust. But from university you suddenly are thrust into the world. And so this is a serious training ground for the attitudes, 
and the behaviors and the competencies that are going to be built when you are going to the outside world. Okay, so I've been introduced. I don't need any further introduction by myself. We would start the class right away. And for today's class, we are going to do grooming. What do we understand by grooming? Anybody here who, I also like interactive classes. You are free to give a comment, to give your opinion, to disagree or agree, but we must all do it in a respectful manner. Are you with me? Yes. This is, this is going to be, I would encourage you to speak along, to contribute, but you must do it in a respective manner. Respect to me, respect to your colleagues. So who can tell me what grooming is? What do you understand? There's no right and wrong answer. Yes. Is your hand up? Okay. Somebody's hand is up there. Okay. So um, for me, I have two ways I define grooming. The first way for me is um, when we say we are grooming someone, we are preparing that person to take a position of importance. So if um, you are head of a company, you can groom someone who will succeed you as CEO or as head of that department or company. Then also grooming is the act of keeping oneself clean and well dressed or well um, suited to an event or a setting. So that's the definition of grooming for me. Thank you. Thank you. I heard that. Any other person? Yes. Um, hello. So I think grooming is a culture from, from, or in my own words, grooming is, um, the way you are brought up or a way that some things are inculcated in you to make you, you. Yeah, to make you, you. That's true. And this is a leadership class. You are being trained to be leaders. I understand you also have entrepreneurship classes. So it's not just about you being employed in a company, but it's also about you being your own employer. And same values apply. Same, same. Because who would give, who would give a contract to somebody who looks like a riffraff? Are you with me? If I'm giving you a contract, the first impression the first time i meet you i must form a good opinion about you otherwise i won't be comfortable giving you a contract but as a leader you must weld influence how would you be able to weld influence if you are not well groomed so i come to your office and i'm looking anyhow and I say that I'm the owner of a company, you wouldn't even believe me, true or false. At once you profile me. Okay. And so that is how come those in suits are thought to be professionals. Excuse me. Those in suits are thought to be professionals or those in suits are thought to be decent people. And so you would get the the scammers also dressing very appropriately because no matter how you see it, whether you like it or not, first impression counts. And so as a leader, you must have influence. How would you have influence as a leader if you are not well-groomed? And so what do we mean by grooming? Can everybody see? There's people behind the pillars. Can you see? Sure. Okay. So can I have someone read this, please? Where's the microphone? Yeah. There's a hand raised at the back. Grooming is the art of self-presentation and is the sum total of a person's appearance and his attitude as well as a projection of his or her personality. Thank you. Grooming is the art of self-presentation and is the sum total is a total of a person's appearance, his or her attitude, 
as well as the projection of his or her personality. How do we understand this statement? Who can say something about this statement? Does it make sense? I haven't heard a female voice. Sounds to me like I'm the only female in the room. What do we understand by this statement? Somebody, please. Okay, so how I perceive this definition is that grooming is the art of how you present yourself to the external environment. And it is not only your appearance, it's not how you look, but it's also a combination of how you look and how you present yourself to others via your attitude and your personality. You are not wrong. Okay. So when we say grooming, we are not talking about just how you look. We are talking about your attitude as well. I mean, the HR field, now we have more for attitude than your knowledge. If you come for the interview and we read some attitude that we don't want to have in our organization, chances are that you may not get the job. You may be the best qualified, but attitude is difficult to change if the person, him or herself, is not ready to change. And so when we say that this person is a well-groomed person, we are talking about the person's appearance as well as the person's attitude and the person's personality. A lot of things can be learned. You may have a personality that puts a lot of people off. But if you are conscious of it and work at it, you can have a better personality. Now, there are types of grooming. We have the physical that has to do with your appearance. We have the metaphysical. That has to do with your attitude. And then we have the professional grooming. So you want to get into a role. You want to get into a job. How do you get yourself to get into the role? Okay. That's the professional. Now let's talk about physical appearance. It says that appropriate grooming and hygiene is an important part of managing your image. Let's talk about physical appearance. And so I, I, we, we are all using the lift. And you enter the lift and you greet, good morning. And everybody turns their face away because you have a mouth odor. You have dented your image. Right away, you've dented your image. You are sitting in an auditorium like this. We are close packed. It's an air-conditioned place. And then the person seated by you is a talkative. But anytime the person opens his or her mouth, you are looking for a hole to put your head in. The ladies are rasta. Sometimes Arasta smells. With all apologies to the men. <laughs> or, a city, the ladies had, you've never had a scent. The guys, I'm asking the guys. <laughs> you see, when, when, when you're in the university and you're being given pocket money, you want to manage your pocket money. Because there are certain things that as an university student you'd want, but mommy and daddy may not be ready to sponsor that. And so you want to save for your frivolities. And so you can keep your hair for like three months, the whole semester. Oh, true or false? I see the ladies arguing. True or false? Lady in red. What's the argument? Yes, you. You've kept your hair since September. Mm. So do you wash it? Okay. Okay. So at least she has kept, but she's been washing. Somebody will keep, but will not wash. 
And in our hot, hot climate, we are always sweating under our hair. And so, why would you keep your rasta for three months and you haven't washed? Not even once. Yeah. Meanwhile, you are a nice girl. So, when the guys see you, they want to hug you. And they hug you and the smell from top of your head is a not not. It means that you are poorly groomed. Okay. Your face. You are a lady. You can't just wake up, put on your clothes, out of your room, and you haven't touched your face. You are in the university. You are learning to go to the outside world. At least, learn to put on, if for nothing, put on white powder. Do something to your face. Your face can't just be like a JSS student's face. No, it's not acceptable. So the ladies here, if you don't know how to put on anything, at least white powder, put it on your face. It changes your face. Okay. It's important that you look after your skin. So you have acne. Are you here? You have acne. Do something. You can't just say that, oh, as for me, I've never had a smooth face. So you won't do anything about it. See a dermatologist. There's something that could be done so that at least, if your face is not smooth, smooth, your face would be even. And do not bleach. I, <laughs> do not bleach. If anybody has, has a reason to bleach, perhaps it's me. But you are dark. And that's how, so we are, we are dark and proud. That's how we are. Need we be fair? It means that we are telling God that you made a mistake. Why did you not create me like my fair lady over there? She is she. I am me. Am I her? Is she me? Okay. And then your clothes. Gentlemen. Whatever you do, a man sweats and has, um, now I'm refining my words. I'm looking for the appropriate words so the guys will be, um, but whatever it is, a man has a stronger scent than a woman. Yes. Unless the woman has a problem, but ordinarily, a man has a stronger scent than a woman. A man and a woman would sweat, but you would smell it more on the man than the woman. All things being equal. Okay. So the gentlemen, we are in a hot climate. You see, this class, it's sounding like it's very elementary. It's not that elementary because we have interns and national service persons who have just come into the institution. And as soon as you meet a person, you can tell this is an intern or this is a national service. Sometimes the guys, they come into your office and leave the scent and go away. Okay. It's important that you are conscious that as a human being, you can easily start smelling. Okay. But if you are a man... You can smell even stronger. Thou shalt not repeat your clothes. In our climate, wash. Take your clothes to the laundry. I know that ACT, you people have a laundromat, right? So if you can't wash by yourself, take it to the laundry. Don't, don't wear one the whole day for lectures and then tomorrow you put it on again. By all means, there will be a saint. Okay. And then we come down. We come down to undergarments. Men, you repeat your boxer shorts. True or false?
I'm not a man. True or false? <laughs> True or false? Shh. Be with me, be with me. Thou shalt not repeat undergarments. The ladies. Okay, so you are laughing at the gentlemen. Stop repeating your black brass the whole semester. Let's continue. We are coming down. Socks and shoes. I see he's wearing socks. I don't expect that tomorrow lectures he's wearing the same pair of socks. <laughs> I know that the gentlemen wear their black socks like they wash it like once in three months. <laughs> Okay, so let's go on. Are you with me? Okay. By all means, we need to both men and women, we need to use deodorant. If you don't use it, you smell. But you don't want to create such an image for yourself. It's a big put off when somebody is by you and the person is smelling not good. It's a very big put off. Your armpit is smelling. Your shoes are smelling. You open your mouth, your mouth is smelling. Your rasta is smelling. It's a bit too much. Okay. And it does not show respect. Are you with me? It does not show respect to the people you are interacting with. It means that you don't care and you don't respect them. That's what it means. So if you are not well-groomed, it's an insult to the people you are interacting with and it dents your own image. Appropriate dressing. There's a dressing for everywhere. And so that's why I'm saying that a lot of you are not well groomed. Okay. Guy in Kente, please come. Okay. He says look like Kente, but it's not Kente after all. He's coming for lectures. He's in his trainers. He's in his jeans. Proper. He's wearing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I wish I could call someone here for the other side. But perhaps that person would be embarrassed. But... You are coming for lectures. Are you with me? You are coming for lectures. You are going to meet other people. Don't take it for granted. Okay. Don't let it be so familiar that you think that you are at home. You are at home when you are the hostel. You are not at home when you come for lectures. I could have decided to come here in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, but it wouldn't be an appropriate dressing and it would, it would be a disrespect to you. So when you are coming for lectures, at least be in a pair of jeans, a pair of, even shorts is not, is not recommended. Okay. Because shorts is a casual way. When you are coming for lectures, it's not casual. And that is one thing Legon students beat ACT students. You are too casual. You have to be in a decent top. Your, your, your trousers, or even if it's a pair of shorts, it should be long. It shouldn't be like shorts you are just walking about in. No, after lectures where you are met in that, that's appropriate. But when you're coming to lectures, you must be a bit more formal. That shows that you are going out. You're going out and you're being at home. The dressing shouldn't be the same. If you are dressing like you are at home and I come to your lecture room and I see the same dressing, you are not appropriately dressed. You are coming into a gathering. 
in order to respect the people you are coming to meet, you have to be appropriately dressed. And that is part of good grooming. And so the next time I come to a city and I meet this class, I don't expect to see flip-flop. I even saw somebody in oversized Crocs. It's, it's not on. It's nice for you to be in a decent t-shirt. You are wearing a pair of trousers. You are wearing your trainers or you are wearing your pair of sandals. Slippers, no. Slippers doesn't fly. Okay. And so you get to translate it at the workplace. So I work in a bank. So we, we dress very conservatively and we are in suits. And then you see a fresh from school guy in a suit. And when, guys, you have this shoe. It looks like tea bread. It is, I don't know how to describe it. It has rounded, rounded edges. Picture this. You know tea bread. No, do you know tea bread? I'm trying to see if anybody is wearing that. I want to describe that. It's, they look, they look loafy and they are rounded at the edges. Have you seen the, the show I'm talking about? Is somebody wearing one here? And then you meet somebody from school wearing suits. The person has, has been able to put a jacket over a trousers as should be. That is the dress code. And the person is wearing that tea bread shoe. It's so not not. The dressing just goes off because when you're wearing a suit, you must wear a pair of proper shoes. You cannot wear, for instance, you cannot wear a suit with a pair of sandals. Okay. You cannot wear, even when you are wearing jeans, as soon as you are wearing jeans and you wear a pair of heels, it becomes dressy. The lady is true or false? Yeah. When you wear jeans and you wear slippers, it's so casual. But as soon as you wear a pair of high heels, it becomes dressy. There's a dressing for everywhere. You cannot crisscross. Otherwise, you wouldn't be well groomed. When you're at home, you can wear flip-flops, but you cannot go outside with your flip-flops. I attended every girls and were taught that you cannot come out of your house, even to an open area in flip-flops. You have to be in some slippers, a more dignifying slippers than bathroom slippers. It was a total against school rules to be found on the compound of the school in bathroom slippers. It still exists, right? The big girl students here, doesn't it? Marian, does it exist? Yeah. Okay. So even then, back then, we were being taught how to groom. It's important that you learn how to be properly groomed because it makes a statement about you. Can somebody read this, please? You are saying something with your appearance, whether you mean to or not. So you may as well mean to. Yeah. You are saying something about your appearance. You may decide that that's for me. I don't care. But it's not about you. It's about the perception of the person perceiving you. What impression are you giving about yourself? Whatever you do, whether you like it or not, how you dress speaks about you. It may be wrong. You may be a very decent person, but that day the person met you, your, your tattered jeans and hold t-shirts and t-shirts with some blazing, excuse my language, fuck you, written boldly on the t-shirt, gives an impression about you. At once the person profiles you and puts you in a certain box. 
And there are some people, when they put you in a box, you struggle to come out of that box. And any dealings with you, that box you are in affects the dealings. When you come out and you start working properly, it's so important that you don't let people misconstrue who you are. It's critical. Because however the person sees you, that is how you'll be treated. And so there's a role, a higher role. But because you don't carry yourself well, you, somebody recommends you, somebody says, Charlie, that guy is from a city, and that guy is sharp. And then another person says, oh, he's too lousy. His appearance puts me off. I don't think he's fit for that rule. And at once, you lose a lifetime opportunity. It happens. I'm in HR. I know what I'm talking about. Okay. So in school, you may think that, oh, as for me. But the outside world there profiles you all the time. And so it's better for you to learn the habits from school so that when you come out, you are already groomed or you are on the way of being well-groomed. And so it's not a problem when you are given a dress code. When we employ young ones like you, sometimes they find the dress code very restrictive, very conservative, and they complain about it. You are in suit the whole day and they complain about it that it's too restrictive. But yeah, you're working in a conservative environment and you cannot dress casually because we do not want the customers to think that we are anyhow people. We want our customers to have the impression that we are serious. Somebody's giving you his or her money. You don't want the person thinking that you are anyhow. You want the person to think and know and believe that his or her money is safe. So whether you like it or not, you are being profiled. And it is not about you. It's about the person perceiving you. Good grooming and hygiene are essential. It's never early to start being concerned about your appearance. Because first impressions are everything. My first impression about you if it is wrong and it's a wrong impression, you have to work extra hard to change that wrong impression I have about you. On the other hand, you may be very, very hollow, but you presented yourself well. You spoke well. Remember that good grooming is not just about your appearance. It's about how you talk, your diction, da boy. Your generation, you have some English. I, I don't know where you got it from. Da boy, da girl. It's, that is T-H-A-T. It is not da. Your generation, you do not know how to say yes. Yes, please. It is not in your dictionary. Yeah. Your lecture asked something. Somebody answered from the back and said, yeah, and I said in my head, there we go. And so you come to the workplace, and your bosses, 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 boss, you are like, like seven layers, there's like seven layers between the two of you. And he walks up to you in the office and says, oh, did you have a good night? Yeah. Because that, that is how you've practiced it. And you brought it outside to the world. And then immediately, your bosses, 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 bosses profiles you. And says, this is not a respectful person. He may be wrong. But that is the first impression. And so it is in his head that you are not respectful. Because you didn't say yes, sir. Or yes, please. And you said, yeah. The language, yeah, remove it from your vocabulary. It is so not, not. It may be okay when you are in school, but you see, if you do not practice speaking well, it becomes, what, however you speak, becomes part of you. And so wherever you are, it shows. 
even in your essays, yes becomes yeah. But yeah is street language. Yeah, it's street language. You can say it to your friends, but you cannot say it outside your friend group. So from today, practice saying yes instead of yeah. Your lecturer is standing in front of you and asking you a question. You, and you're answering, you don't say yeah. You say yes, sir. Yes, please. That is how to speak. Okay. It may sound that I'm being, I'm sure in your head you are saying, oh, this one, she's of the old school. She started working when we were not even born. Yeah, I'm of the old school. And is the old school who would employ you? Or is the new school who will employ you? It's the old school. So it's so relevant. We are not dead. So you walk into my office. Oh, hello. What's your name? My name is Insha. Oh, pretty girl. Insha, where did you do your, so you've come for national service. Where did you take your first degree? Academic city. Oh, A city. I'm affiliated. I love the school. Insha, oh, then you say, oh, yeah, yeah. Then I'm like, <laughs> excuse me. Okay. So you'd realize that at once, the, convers- the tone of the conversation drops because now the person has profiled you wrongly just because of one word you said. So mind the first impression you give to anybody. How you want somebody to see you is how you should project. Don't project something wrongly that you are not. Metaphysical. So we are saying that the metaphysical deals with projecting certain attributes of one's personality. What you want the world to see, project it. Okay. So do you want the world to, to know that you speak well? Public speaking is not a problem. Project that. Everybody has a bat. Everybody has a bad side. Everybody has a weakness that you'd have to all your life be battling. Okay, nobody is is a hundred percent. But you are an eighty percent of something. Project that. Don't project the twenty percent weakness. Because when you project the twenty percent weakness, that is what the person knows you to be. But that may be wrong. You have an 80% that is far better. As a leader, you'd want to project integrity. So your yes is your yes. Your no is your no. Start practicing it now. When you would come for lectures, say yes, I will. When you wouldn't be able to come, say no, I won't be able to come. Don't tell your friend that, oh, Charlie, look for space for me, I'm coming. And then you sleep. Let that person leave a space for you, knowing for sure that once you, you have said you'd come, come what me, you'd come. It's critical that you project a personality of integrity. Self-awareness. Be aware of who you are. There's a saying that goes that if you don't say, I am, nobody will say, you are. So, I am this. I'm a pleasant person. I'm a principled person. I am a person of integrity. I know myself. On the other hand, I know that when I'm pushed to the wall, I am not pleasant. And so I would work at when I'm pushed to the wall, I still maintain my pleasantness. That is the 80% of me most of the time. Who are you? You should be able to profile yourself and profile yourself in all sincerity. You know your weakness. You know it's better than any other person. 
So what are your weaknesses and what are your strengths? It is your strength that you must project to the world. And then you quietly work on your weakness. Okay. Empath, courage. As a leader, you need to be courageous. How would you be courageous and tell somebody? So, at, typically at the workplace, courage would mean that, okay, that's a project and you do not know anything about it and yet you are the leader. But you must have the courage to take on the project. You must have the courage to go to somebody who is a team member and say, you know what? I do not understand this. Although I'm supposed to lead, I do not understand it. Can we have a discussion? It takes courage for you to accept that you do not know. But we all do not know everything. You cannot know everything. And so the courage to say that I am humbling myself for me to be taught, it's a virtue. And it's all part of grooming. Respect. As a leader, you have to be respectful. I have to respect you and you have to respect me. It is only the people people respect that they follow. If I don't respect you, why would I follow you? But if I respect you, I would want to follow you. I would want to emulate you. I would want to speak as you speak. I would want to dress as you dress. I would want to, I mean, in my head, you are my role model. Because of the respect I have for you. As a leader, you cannot afford to be disrespected. Because as soon as somebody is disrespecting you, it means that the person has actually stopped following you. The person will stop following you in his or her heart before it's manifest in the physical. But if you are a leader and you are well groomed and you command respect, grooming would, would make you command respect. Because in terms of appearance, you are there. In terms of the metaphysical, you are there. In terms of even being professionally groomed for the rule, you are there. And so it makes you command a lot of respect. And it's easier for you to be followed if you are a leader. If you command respect. Empathy. What do we mean by empathy? Being able to put yourself in another person's shoes. There's a difference between empathy and sympathy. Who knows? Or who can hazard a guess? Yes. Okay, so the difference between sympathy and empathy is that when you are sympathizing with somebody, you feel pity for them. Okay. But when you are empathizing with somebody, you are putting yourself in that situation that they are going through. And so you are able to understand their emotions better as compared to when you are sympathizing with them. Because you don't understand what they are going through. You just feel bad for them. Okay, so thank you. You are, you are spot on. So, so I tell you that, okay, my dad is dead. I'm crying. You don't even understand why I'm crying, but you cry with me. You are sympathizing. I'm crying and you too, you have tears in your eyes. Or I may not even tell you why I'm crying. Okay. You came to meet me crying. And at once you sat by me and you also started crying. You are sympathizing. But, okay, so why are you crying? Oh, I lost my dad. Ooh, I know how it feels. I also lost my mom. So I know how you are feeling. You know what? The pain will go away gradually. You are empathizing. As a leader, you have to empathize. You have to be able to put your feet in the shoes of the person going through the situation and understand. So typically at the workplace, you are a leader. You have a nursing mother. A mother who just delivered. And before this lady delivered, she was on point. Her grooming was on point. Physical appearance, she was there. You give her um, deadlines, assignments, she meets it. Now she has a baby and she's supposed to report to work at, say, 7.30. And at 8.30, she's coming in with her hair all over the place and she's all sweaty and she's all over the place. She may have a challenge. Baby cried all night, and so she wasn't able to sleep. Just when she started sleeping, her alarm went off. So she woke up, and she was basa. Okay, as a leader, you need to understand that. Okay, so what can I do for my team member who is going through this? Can I let her come to work at maybe nine? 
and close at six? Or can I let her work two days from home and then three days from the office? That's an empathetic leader. Do you understand the difference between empathy and sympathy? Class, are you with me? Yes. Okay. All right. How would we see you as a leader or how would we be able to tell that you'd be able to pick up this role? You have to be confident in your opinions. And confident in your opinion doesn't mean that you wouldn't listen to any other opinion. You know you are right. So you say it, we are in a class, we are having, we are debating an issue. You know that you are sure of what you are saying. And you get up and on the top of your voice, you are, I mean, your word is what we should take. That's not a leader. A leader is confident in the opinion, says, okay, this is what, I think it should be like this, it should be like this. But let me hear what the others think. And after everybody has said whatever, they somersault and pole vote and, all, and we all land, the leader says, but this is how it should go. That's a leader. Ask questions. A leader is not afraid to ask questions. If you are a well-groomed person, you would ask questions. Okay, so this is what I think about this. What do you also think? God didn't um, tie up wisdom, the whole wisdom of the world, and put it in one person's head. No, even Solomon, in all his wisdom, I'm sure that he still had advices. Okay. And so, a leader is not afraid to ask questions. The more you ask questions, the better you gain knowledge. And the, bet the better you gain knowledge, the better you command respect. And the more you command respect, the better people follow you. Are you with me? Okay. Keep learning. You are a leader. Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep learning. Learning never stops at any point in time because things revolve. Technology evolves. You are in a tech university. You know what I'm talking about. Every time technology evolves, even phones, every time they are releasing new ones, you are so... When they released iPhone 11, it was so such a fantastic phone. And so you moved heaven and earth and you got to one. Just when you got to one, the next month, they released 13 with better features. Now, Apple, where are they? Where? 14. Oh, okay. I thought by now there would be like 20. Okay. Find a mentor. It's critical that you find a mentor because you are being groomed to take up a role. You have to look for somebody who you think understands that role better and attach yourself to the person. Learn from the person. Remember that if you want to be a good leader, you don't just go about thinking that what you know is the final. No, you have to be ready to be mentored. And then practice executive thinking. Practice executive thinking means that when there's an issue, ah, how would MD think about this? If I, if I was the MD, how would I have solved this problem? If this company was my own company, I'm running this company, what would I have done? Think like an executive. And then plan, plan, plan. So you are asked, in five years' time, what do you want to be? You said, oh, in five years' time, I would, have, I would wish to have finished my master's, and now I'm working in a high-tech company. Okay. But how are you going to achieve that? It must be on paper and pen. Plan, plan, plan. So I'm planning that when I finish from ACT, I must do one year's service. This, the service, I must make sure that I get a, a tech company, maybe Huawei or Sunny, or even go, go do an internship in one of these high-class tech companies because I want to be a tech guru in 10 years' time. You need to be systematic about it. Know what you want to do and then have a plan towards what you want to do. Accept responsibility. 
you are learning to be a leader. A leader is the one who, when it goes wrong, the leader should say, I'm the one who did it. When it goes right, he would say, oh, it's my team. That's a good leader. A good leader will chest out when there's a problem. But if all goes well, the leader will retreat and let the whole team take the glory. Be authentic. There's no way you can be me. Am I you? You are me. You can't be me. I can't be you. That is why I have a problem with junior pastors who want to be like the senior pastors. They dress like the senior pastors. Haircut is the same. The suit is the same. The shiny shoes. They have some shiny shoes that they wear. The shiny shoes are the same. Be authentic. Be you. Everybody has a way of dressing that suits the person. So I am dark. So I shy away from dark clothes. But unfortunately, I work in a bank, so I cannot shy away from wearing black suits. But outside work, you find me in dark clothes because I am dark. Meanwhile, the fair ones here can wear black t-shirts and it looks so good. When I wear a black t-shirt, everybody will ask me, ah, who is dead? But when a fair person wears a black t-shirt, it does not look off. It does not look like a funeral. Okay, so be authentic. Know yourself. Your head, you you have a mongo pack shaped head. There are some haircuts that your friends are cutting that has become fashionable. But it does not see, your hair type is not, your hair is not okay for that hairstyle. Don't do it. Don't follow fashion blindly. Be authentic. Know yourself. Okay. So what are the benefits of grooming? It makes you look attractive. When you come in and you are well-dressed for the occasion, you cannot be overdressed or underdressed. Sometimes when you go to church, it's an ordinary Sunday. It's not an occasion. Somebody will come in blank, blank dresses. And you are like, ah, what's the occasion? Okay. There's a dressing for every, appropriate dressing for every occasion. It's a normal Sunday. So you are dressed normally. When it's Christmas, everybody is in blink, blink. So it is appropriate for the season. And so when you come and you are dressed for the occasion appropriately, it makes you look attractive. And once you look attractive, the a chemistry builds between you and the person who you are dealing with. And so whatever you are saying, the person is attracted to you. So the person is probably listening. Okay. But if you come and you are your your appearance is a put off, you have lost the person. And so whatever you are doing, so for instance, you are marketing something and you come to my office and you are wearing, it's, it's a corporate environment and you come and you are wearing Crocs and jeans with some holes in it and some t-shirts. And you think that because you are walking a lot from place to place, you need to be as comfortable as possible. So your Crocs is your most comfortable pair of shoes. And you walk into my office and you are selling me something, maybe a high-tech solution. And I'm not listening because as you are talking, I am profiling you. And I'm putting you in a box. And that box, I'm shutting the box. And so whatever you are saying... It's not, it's not getting to me. I have totally switched off from you. If you are well-groomed, you'd be attractive. And then you would project a positive image. So you are dressed well. So as soon as a person sees you and you start talking about this software that is so fantastic, the person's like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. This guy, I mean, it seems like he knows what he's talking about. His appearance even shows that he's a serious boy. So when I'm listening to you, I am listening because I have profiled you and I'm thinking that the positive image you are giving to me is correlating 
with the, the solution you are providing. And it was just about your grooming. Okay. It builds up you yourself, your self-confidence and self-esteem. It, as soon as you are dressed well and you stand in front of the mirror, at once you square up your shoulders and you look at yourself and you straighten yourself and you now you know that you are looking good. Okay, at once it builds your confidence. So when you are walking into a room full of people, you know that you are not overdressed and you are not underdressed and you are looking just there. And so you enter the room with your best foot forward. But when you enter the room and you see how people are well dressed and you see that you are not properly dressed, at once you take a step back and then you have to psych yourself to get the confidence to even move into the room again. So you start off with your wrong foot because you are are starting off with a low self-esteem. Good grooming helps in a better appearance. You look better when you are properly groomed. It improves your health. Who says that if you brush your teeth twice a day, you won't have a good dental health? You will. And your mouth will smell good. And then it enhances your spiritual growth, believe it or not. If you are scruffy, you take the scruffiness into the spiritual realm. But if you are on point, even in the spiritual realm, you are on point. So all we are saying, I'm missing an L, sorry. All we are saying is that grooming takes you from one level to the other level. And so it's essential that we are properly groomed. Thank you. And questions. Hello, I'm Archibald. Um, you know, I, I normally ask the guest lecturers like challenges. Um, but then your, I think he, he was right. Your, sli- your slides were very concise. They were straight to the point. But Thank then I you. do have, um, another, another question. So this, a cultural play out question. So like I, I made a note. Sorry. Let me just say it. So do you think grooming is based majorly now on, um, Sorry, on cultural involvement, and if you do, what can be done? Let me try and elaborate more. For example, if we are looking at the the how the Ghanaian setting works, mm-hmm. um, there are some things that culture doesn't allow us to do. For example, we can't dress shabbily to some events, mm-hmm. um, because of the people we know are going to be there. But then, if you are looking at a departmental, um, or if you are looking at a, f- a section or a fraction of something in a different country, sometimes there's ease to dressing. Um, even though we find ourselves in d- different cultures, do you think if we push too hard, n- let me give an ex- another example, how we have to be time conscious. My sister was in France for some time and how Ghana, we say um, nine o'clock, it's nine o'clock, but over there, if you delay n- n- and you get there even at night 10, you, s- you find out that people are actually not there. So, um, how do you think cultural play out in the, in the, the years to come would um, affect grooming? Okay. Yeah, it would. In fact, it's affecting. For my, um, my dissertation, when I was doing my master's in international relations, my dissertation was the effect of globalization on our culture. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of difference that we have now. Um, whatever we do, we are in a global village. The internet ensures that we are in a global village. And so, um, I see an Indian in the class. I mean, in those days, how would an Indian travel all the, how would an Indian even know that a country called Ghana exists? Okay, and if I go to church and I see somebody wearing a sari, I would admire it and immediately I'll say, oh, this is Indian dressing. 
Globalization has affected our way of talking. We talk like Americans. This year, yeah, it is not as it is not British. We were British colonized. The year is not in their vocabulary. It's in American vocabulary. And even in American, in street language, it's a slang. So we probably picked it up from the movies we are watching or the books we are reading. And so, yes, our culture is affected to a large extent. But must we lose the good part of our culture? That's the question. Must we? An Indian will wear her sari wherever she is. Why do we not want to be in our traditional cloth? What is wrong with Kaben slates? When the black stars wore a smock, you saw the fans they received. Nobody expected them to go on a football pitch in a smock. But that is what they paraded in. Because for northern Ghana, they wear smock. That is their dress code. And they decided to depict northern Ghana. Okay. Is it because they are in Qatar, so they have to be in, in a Jalabia? No. That's, that, is not, that is not our culture. Okay. So, in answering your question, yes, because of globalization, industrialization, um, mixture of culture, our culture would be affected. It is affected. Okay. It is not a future thing. It is a present thing. But then we have to safeguard the good as the, the, the identity of the Ghanaian must not be lost. The Nigerian would always go for green and white. No matter what you do, the Nigerian definitely has green attire. And when it comes to a function, they, 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 they proudly would wear their green and white. The Ghanaian is shying away from wearing the kente because we think that, oh, it's too colorful. It will make us stand out too much. But the Nigerian is very bold about his green and white. In Africa, Nigeria is the country that has maintained their identity and they protect their identity, whatever it is. They are not shy to say they are Nigerians. They are not shy to speak their Yoruba loudly on top of their voices. They are, they, are, they are proud to be Nigerians, no matter what the rest of the world thinks. A Nigerian is always proud to be a Nigerian. Yes. And so the fact that we are getting westernized, we are infiltrating other cultures into our culture, doesn't mean that we should lose our identity as Ghanaians. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Next question, please. Yes. Good morning, ma'am. Yeah, good morning. Who's, yeah. who's speaking? I'm okay, here, I'm here. Yeah, sure. um, I'm Isabel, and uh, Hi, my Isabel. question is, if we have to put ourselves in the work environment, mm -hmm. and we find ourselves amongst uh, colleagues or even a boss mm -hmm. that doesn't dress or take care of their appearance mm -hmm. in the manner that the industry would require, wow. and coming from the African culture mm -hmm. and the sorts of stereotypes that we live by, mm -hmm. whereby an employee, I, I believe in the African culture, an employee should not oh, dress better than their boss. And depending on the level that you're in, you should have a certain, how can I put it? You should have a certain way of dressing and carrying yourself that does not outshine those that are superior than you. So how does one maintain uh, well-groomed appearance while still um, not really affecting the way that they are perceived by their colleagues or even by their boss. Thank you for your question. I understand it perfectly because it happens. It does happen. And so a national service guy comes or a lady comes to work and you are in Gucci suits. At once, you are profiled. Either this girl is doing sugar daddy or she's in some stupidly, she's from some stupidly rich family. How is she able to afford a Gucci suit? And I've been working for 21 years and I can't afford a Gucci suit. 
Do you get it? Your appearance, whether you like it or not, it gives an impression about you. It may be a good impression or a bad impression, but it does give an impression about you. You are a national, national service person. Why are you wearing a Gucci suit? Is it that it was well? So you could have, you could have an explanation. Perhaps your mother has a lot of Gucci suits and gave you one. That's an explanation. So it may be one or two items in your clothes, but consistently you are wearing Gucci suits. You are wearing, I mean, you are wearing Prada. Your shoes are Valentino. I mean, Santiago. You, you are a designer from top to bottom. There will be, def- definitely be a question mark on you, Isabel. At every level and what you do. If you have worked for 20 years and you are dressed in designers from head to bottom, nobody will complain because perhaps you have saved a lot and you can afford it, the level. But if you are level zero, ground level, and you are dressing like your chief executive, definitely you'd be profiled, Isabel. Because you are not, you are not in tandem with your level. Are you with me? Does it answer your question? So, behave, act your age. If I should put it like that, act your age. Perhaps you can go for Gucci made in Cantamanto. I mean, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Mause. Sorry. Mause. Mause. Yeah. Um, just two short questions. Right. The first one is um, in like an environment you find yourself, and then you find out that maybe a person is not grooming himself, him or herself properly. Can you hear him? I, I am even struggling. To okay, so me. you find yourself in an environment yeah. where you see you, you have colleagues who are not grooming themselves properly. Yeah. Maybe they are not um, taking care of their appearance, the way they look is not good, they smell bad, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. How would you go about telling them about something you've noticed without being kind of like disrespectful to them because of how people can relate to you? And then secondly, um, when you mentioned the qualities of being a leader, you said you should be uh, honest at all times. You should deal with integrity. But when it came to the professional side as well, you said you should take responsibility for the shortcomings of your um, group members when they fail at something. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that doesn't that kind of counteract against itself because you are now covering up for someone's mistakes. When they make the mistake, you say it's yours, which is a lie. Mm-hmm. But when everyone does the work together and it comes out right, you see it's the entire group. How do you work with that one? Okay, Thank so I'll answer your second question first. As a leader, you are responsible for the act of the team. So it's just like when you are in the army, the army commander. If there's an attack, the army commander has a responsibility to bring out his men and bring them out alive. So he goes to the front. If all is well, he's at the back. Okay. If you are a leader of a team, you are responsible for the actions of the team. If your team member does something and the whole team goes wrong and you are being queried, it is so unleader-like for you to fish out the person, the single person, and let the person be at the battlefield. The other followers, it gives them the message that, hey, if something goes wrong, I would, I would, I would be singled out. And so they become super conscious and it affects the ability of the team to perform. But if they know that they make a mistake unintentionally, we are human. Mistakes happen. They make a mistake, but the leader will stand up and say, hey, I'm the leader of the team. I take responsibility. Okay, so we made a mistake. We are going to correct it by doing this and this and this. You earn their respect. Remember that as a leader, you need to earn their respect so that they can willingly follow you. But if you are the one to give them up, then there's no point in following you because tomorrow, if something goes up, I'm on my own. And so if I'm on my own, then I might as well be on my own all the time. Do you get it? Now, somebody is not well-groomed. Your friend is not well-groomed and he's seated by you and he's blowing fuse. 
and you need to say something. I think that if you're a good friend, you should be able to say it. And so you'd have a nice tagline or startup sentence like, Charlie, I have to tell you something. No malice attached. You know I love you, right? Okay. <laughs> but I need to let you know this. I don't want somebody else to tell you. I'm the closest person to you. So you work on the person's mind before you release the bomb. And when you are releasing the bomb, don't just drop it. You say, Charlie, I have noticed. Ah, is your deodorant finished? <laughs> oh, ah, Charlie, today, did you take your bath before coming? Charlie, it'd be like you did mail small. I think that guys... Guys, guys, that conversation should be easy. It's women that we are some way. So when you go and say it, your friend may never talk to you again. But guys, you're able to diss yourselves. Or, or it's not like that. Ah, you can't tell your friend that Charlie be like you the male small. You should be able to say it. Your 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 the girls, it's a problem. You have to wrap it and you have to massage hair, and you know, you have to do a lot of things, but if you are a good friend, let the person, there's something called tough love. Tough love. That's when you have to demonstrate tough love. I'm your friend. People are talking about you. People are saying, as for this girl, she smells. And I'm a friend and I'm working with you. And I am not smelling. But I hear people say that about you. Why should it be another person who would gather the courage to come and talk to you when I am supposed to be the closest person to you? And so if you should be able to take negative feedback. It isn't all criticisms that are, are harmful. There are some criticisms that it will help you change. And feedback is not always positive. If you have a friend who is always saying good things about you, that person is not being a true friend. You should be able to look your friend in the eye and say, Charlie, I said, Nan saying, you don't smell too good. Is your deodorant finished? And you shouldn't take offense. That is tough love. So say it, okay? But say it well. You don't want to break the person's spirit. You are just saying something that is not pleasant and yet has to be said. Does it answer your question? Okay. Any more? Um, my question is on first appearances. So assuming you've been able to pass the check and you've made a very good impression, but that's not who you are, how do you manage like for the rest? Um, for an example, assuming you are able to give a first impression that you're a very punctual person, but you know very well that your time management is very bad. How do you keep up for the rest of your life after making, I don't see a false impression, but that's not who you are. Thank you. So how did you manage to give that first impression? Okay. So you gave it. That first day, you came early, and your boss said, oh, Charlie, looks like you are a punctual person. Keep it up, keep it up. It means that he has placed a weight on you. And tomorrow morning, wake up early, because your boss says, you are a punctual. So say to yourself, I'm a punctual person, and work at it. But first impression, so in interviews, there's something called the halo effect and the horn effect. Halo as in H-A-L-O, you know, like the ring round the head of an angel. Halo effect. So somebody comes. So we are on a panel, seated, and then somebody comes in to be interviewed. And are you here? Are you with me? Yes, please. And somebody comes in, and the person is well-dressed. We ask the questions, and the person speaks well, the diction is good and all. At once, the panel sitting there, if they are not very well trained, at once somebody begins to like you. 
And so the person avoids asking you their different, their questions are in front of them. They decide what question to ask you. So when the person likes you, the person will probably ask you all the soft questions because the person is willing for you to pass. Then there's the horn effect. I see the horn. H-O-R-N. The horn you find on Satan. So you enter, and the first impression is, who is this coffee person? What is the person even doing here? It is so likely, human as we are, if the panel is not well trained to take out those biases, they would begin to ask you the most difficult questions on the list because they don't want you to pass. They don't want you in the company. Do you get me? You have given a wrong or a right impression of who you are. So the person who gave the right impression may not even be the best fit, but because they ask all the soft questions, the person passes and gets through. What about you? Who is the top of your class? Who is good at what you do? Who is brainy, intelligent, smart, creative? Who walked in like a riffraff? And because of the horn effect, you did not get the job. First impression, never forget, always counts. Next question. Okay. Okay, so my name is Jessica Ai, and my question to you is relating to certain cultural norms that have been normalized in society. Um, for instance, Certain things have become no normalized, like multiple piercings, wearing of anklets, having dyed hair, etc. And it's becoming incorporated even in the corporate world because some leaders also do that. Some leaders also tend to adopt these things. And while these things, like you mentioned, they are from the westernized world, we have, ad we have adopted those things and we have started using those things. How do we, as the upcoming generation, understand not to conform to that and to remain, um, like you said, um, retain our identity as a Ghanaian, Ghanaian citizens. Because since it's becoming so normalized, it won't be, it's only a matter of time before people will start doing the same thing. Our employers, our bosses will start doing the same thing, even in a conservative environment. So how do you stay close to who you are? How do you retain that part of you that does not conform to these things? And would you even consider conforming to these things? Those are the questions in my mind right now. So it's about you. It's a choice you have to make. Everybody is doing piercings. Okay. You know that it's not allowed in your home. And so you cannot do it. In my home, I would not allow my daughters to pierce. They know. They try to talk me out of it, but it's a blanket no. I am of the old school. I accept. I'm not dead, so we are there. <laughs> you see, we can't lose our identity. There's no way your grandmother would, would, would sanction those plenty ear piercings that you've done. Okay. Because in our culture, it was certain class of people who did that. Anklets on your leg, piercings, nose ring. At once you are put, and excuse me, if anybody is doing that here, what I'm going to say is not a slight on your personality. But we used to see those people who do that as prostitutes. Is that the impression you want people to have about you? I mean, if you don't mind somebody seeing you as a prostitute, that's fine. But I would not employ you. I would not employ you. You are coming for an interview and you have piercings and you have anklets and you have jewelry and your makeup is so loud at once. The profile I would profile is this girl will be difficult to manage. I, I have enough troubles on my hand. This girl, I cannot manage her. I won't employ you. 
But you may be the most intelligent. You may be what the company wants. But the company is ready to let you go and take a substandard person because of your appearance. Your appearance is giving the impression that this is a hard girl. She will not conform. She will be difficult to manage. She would be, she would break every rule that we have set. And so we do not want such a troublesome person. So whether you would conform or not, it's a personal decision you have to take. You know the home you come from. In my home, I will not tolerate. Would your mother tolerate? Maybe. So it's fine. In your home, it's accepted. It's not accepted in my home. So, so long as you are my daughter, he said, no. And the no is, there's no qualification to the no. It's a no. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's put our hands together. There's a last hand up there. Can I take that last one? Okay, so you have a lot of hair. If I heard you correctly, you have a lot of hair. So your beard grows... Your hair grows, yeah. Why would you not like cutting? No, it's going. So somebody who is a scanty would have to cut in two weeks. You will cut in three days. I'm sorry. Much as the, the hair is supposed to be a blessing, it can be cursed, it can become a curse in the sense that it is draining your pocket. You have to be cutting. Because if the dress code says no facial hair, as in a bank, you need to shave. Unless you are saying that it is between your facial hair and your job. So to hell with your job. I want to keep my face. Okay. But in so long as you chose the job, the job says the dress code is clean face. And no matter how fast your hair goes, if it means that every day you have to shave, you shave. And we have those challenges in that. There are men at my workplace who I'm constantly on because he just leaves his face for three days and it is like he just woke up from bed. He's all hairy. Okay, some people are very hairy. But you work in an environment that says no facial hair and you need to conform. If you work in a crazy tech company where they don't care, you leave it. But how, somehow, even there, you can't, because when the hair is growing, it grows in all directions. So even when you want to keep a beard, you need to trim it. It gives you a better look. And remember all the plenty things we said. <laughs> if you are well-groomed, it makes you attractive, it makes people willing to listen to you and all that. I remember when we were in secondary school, there was this half-caste girl who came and she said she, she's a half-caste, so she won't cut her hair. The headmistress said, oh, I mean, you don't have to come to Ebri Girls. There are so many other schools in Ebri Girls. Junior, when we were in set form, we maintained our hair, so we're braiding our hair. I think I was the last but two batch while well, batch was the last but two batch to stop braiding hair. But in junior forms, you have to cut your hair. She cut the hair. Oh, your brony, so what? No, so what? It's just that their, their texture is not like our texture. So an Indian's hair grows straight down. Okay? But you, they will let you trim it, although yours is hanging, but it will be trimmed. You will have that long hair. You won't. Why should the Ghanaians cut their hair and because you have a different skin color, you won't cut? I thought the dress code was short hair. Why is the goalpost changing for somebody because of the color of their skin? For me, it's discrimination. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, let's put our hands together finally. <laughs>